Chapter Two of Moonfleet. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Simon Evers. Moonfleet by J. Mead Faulkner. Chapter Two, The Floods. Then banks came down with ruin and rout. Then beaten spray flew round about. Then all the mighty floods were out. And all the world was in the sea. Jean Ingelow. On the third of November, a few days after this visit to the Why Not, the wind, which had been blowing from the southwest, began about four in the afternoon to rise in sudden strong gusts. The rooks had been pitch falling all the morning, so we knew that bad weather was due. And when we came out from the schooling that Mr. Glennie gave us in the hall of the old almshouses, there were wisps of thatch and even stray tiles flying from the roofs, and the children sang, "Blow wind, rise storm, ship ashore before morn." It is heathenish rhyme that has come down out of other and worse times, for though I do not say but that a wreck on Moonfleet Beach was looked upon sometimes as little short of a godsend. Yet I hope none of us were so wicked as to wish a vessel to be wrecked that we might share in the plunder. Indeed, I have known the men of Moonfleet risk their own lives a hundred times to save those of shipwrecked mariners, as when the Darius East Indiaman came ashore. Nay, even poor nameless corpses washed up were sure of Christian burial, or perhaps of one of Master Ratsey's headstones to set forth sex and date, as may be seen in the churchyard to this day. Our village lies near the centre of Moonfleet Bay, a great bight twenty miles across, and a death trap to up-channel sailors in a south-westerly gale. For with that wind blowing strong from south, if you cannot double the snout, you must most surely come ashore. A many a good ship failing to round to that point has beat up and down the bay all day, but come to beach in the evening. And once on the beach, the sea has little mercy. For the water is deep right in, and the waves curl over full on the pebbles with a weight no timbers can withstand. Then, if poor fellows try to save themselves, there is a deadly undertow or rush back of the water, which sucks them off their legs and carries them again under the thundering waves. It is that back suck of the pebbles that you may hear for miles inland, even at Dorchester, on still nights long after the winds have caused it to have sunk. And which make people turn in their beds, and thank God they are not fighting with the sea on Moonfleet Beach. But on this third of November there was no wreck, only such a wind as I have never known before, and only once since. All night long the tempest grew fiercer, and I think no one in Moonfleet went to bed, for there was such a breaking of tiles and glass, such a banging of dune and rattling of shutters, that no sleep was possible. And we were afraid, besides, lest the chimneys should fall and crush us. The wind blew fiercest about five in the morning, and then some ran up the street, calling out a new danger that the sea was breaking over the beach, and that all the place was likely to be flooded. Some of the women were for flitting forthwith and climbing the down, but Master Ratsey, who was going round with others to comfort people, soon showed us that the upper part of the village stood so high that if the water was to get thither. There was no knowing if it would not cover ridge down itself. But what with its being a spring tide and the sea breaking clean over the great outer beach of pebbles, a thing that had not happened for fifty years, there was so much water piled up in the lagoon that it passed its bounds and flooded all the sea meadows and even the lower end of the street. So when day broke, there was the churchyard flooded. Though it was on rising ground, and the church itself standing up like a steep little island, and the water over the door sill of the Why Not, though Elzevir Block would not budge, saying he did not care if the sea swept him away. It was but a nine hours' wonder, for the wind fell very suddenly, the water began to go back, the sun shone bright, and before noon people came out to the doors to see the floods and talk over the storm. Most said there never had been so fierce a wind. But some of the oldest spoke of one in the second year of Queen Anne, and would have it as bad or worse. But whether worse or not, this storm was a weighty matter enough for me, and turned the course of my life, as you shall hear. 
I have said that the waters came up so high that the church stood out like an island, but they went back quickly, and Mr. Lenny was able to hold service on the next Sunday morning. Few enough folks came to Moonfleet Church at any time, but fewer still came that morning, for the meadows between the village and the churchyard were wet and miry from the water. There were streamers of seaweed tangled about the very tombstones, and against the outside of the churchyard wall was piled up a great bank of it, from which came a salt, rancid smell, like a guillemot's egg that is always in the air after a south-westerly gale has strewn the shore with rack. This church is as large as any other I have seen, and divided into two parts, with a stone screen across the middle. Perhaps Moonfleet was once a large place, and then likely enough there were people to fill such a church. But never since I knew it did any one worship in that part called the nave. This western portion was quite empty, beyond a few old tombs and a royal arms of Queen Anne. The pavement, too, was damp and mossy, and there were green patches down the white walls where the rains had got in. So the handful of people that came to church were glad enough to get to the other side of the screen in the chancel, where at least the pew floors were boarded over, and the panelling of oat work kept off the draughts. Now this Sunday morning there were only three or four, I think, beside Mr. Glenny and Ratsey, and the half-dozen of us boys, who crossed the swampy meadows strewn with drowned shrew-mice and moles. Even my aunt was not at church, being prevented by a migraine. But a surprise waited those who did go, for there in a pew by himself sat Elzevir Block. The people stared at him as they came in, for no one had ever known him go to church before, some saying in the village that he was a Catholic, and others an infidel. However that might be, there he was this day, wishing perhaps to show a favour to the parson who had written the verses for David's headstone. He took no notice of anyone, nor exchanged greetings with those that came in, as was the fashion in Moonfleet Church, but kept his eyes fixed on a prayer-book which he held in his hand, though he could not be following the minister, for he never turned the leaf. The church was so damp from the floods that Master Ratsey had put a fire in the brazier which stood at the back, but was not commonly lighted till the winter had fairly begun. We boys sat as close to the brazier as we could, for the wet cold struck up from the flags, and besides that we were so far from the clergyman, and so well screened by the oak backs, that we could bake an apple or roast a chestnut without much fear of being caught. But that morning there was something else to take off our thoughts, for, before the service was well begun, we became aware of a strange noise under the church. The first time it came was just as Mr. Glenny was finishing, Dearly Beloved, and we heard it again before the second lesson. It was not a loud noise, but rather like that which a boat makes jostling against another at sea, and there was something deeper and more hollow about it. We boys looked at each other, for we knew what was under the church, and that the sound could only come from the Mahoon vault. No one at Moonfleet had ever seen the inside of that vault, but Ratsey was told by his father, who was clerk before him, that it underlay half the chancel, and that there were more than a score of Mahoons lying there. It had not been opened for over forty years, since Gerald Mahoon, who burst a blood-vessel drinking at Weymouth races, was buried there. But there was a tale that one Sunday afternoon, many years back, there had come from the vault so horrible and unearthly a cry, that parson and people got up and fled the church, and would not worship there for weeks afterwards. We thought of these stories, and huddled up close to the brazier, being frightened at the noise, and uncertain whether we would not turn tail and run from the church, for it was certain that something was moving in the Mahoon vault, to which there was no entrance except by a ringed stone in the chancel floor that had not been lifted for forty years. However, we thought better of it, and did not budge, though I could see when standing up and looking over the tops of the seats that others beside ourselves were ill at ease for Granny Tucker gave such starts when she heard the sounds, that twice her spectacles fell off her nose into her lap. And Master Ratsey seemed to be trying to mask the one noise by making another himself, whether by shuffling with his feet or by thumping down his prayer-book. But the thing that most surprised me was that even Elzevir Block, who cared, men said, for neither God nor devil, looked unquiet, 
and gave a quick glance at Wairatsi every time the sound came. So we sat, till Mr. Glennie was well on with the sermon. His discourse interested me, though I was only a boy, for he likened life to the letter Y, saying that in each man's life must come a point where two roads part like the arms of a Y, and that every one must choose for himself whether he will follow the broad and sloping path on the left, or the steep and narrow path on the right. For, said he, if you will look in your books, you will see that the letter Y is not like the Mahunes, with both arms equal, but has the arm on the left broader and more sloping than the arm on the right. Hence, ancient philosophers hold that this arm on the left represents the easy downward path to destruction, and the arm on the right the narrow upward path of life. When we heard that, we all fell to searching our prayer-books for a capital Y, and Granny Tucker, who knew not A from B, made much ado in fumbling with her book, for she would have people think that she could read. Then just at that moment came a noise from below, louder than those before, hollow and grating, like the cry of an old man in pain. With that a up jumps Granny Tucker, calling out loud in church to Mr. Lenny, "'Oh, Master, however can he bide there preaching when the moons be rising from their graves?' And out from the church. That was too much for the others, and all fled, Mrs. Viney crying, "'Lord sakes, we shall all be throttled like Cracky Jones!' So in a minute there was none left in the church, save and except Mr. Lenny, with me, Ratsy, and Elzevir Block. I did not run. First, not wishing to show myself coward before the men, second, because I thought that if Blackbird came he would fall on the men rather than on a boy, and third, that if he came to blows, Block was strong enough to give account even of a Mahoon. Mr. Glennie went on with his sermon, making as though he neither heard any noise nor saw the people leave the church, and when he had finished, Elzevir walked out. But I stopped to see what the minister would say to Ratsey about the noise in the vault. The sexton helped Mr. Lenny off with his gown, and then, seeing me standing by and listening, said, "'The Lord has sent evil angels among us. "'Tis a terrible thing, Master Lenny, to hear the dead men moving under our feet.' "'Oh, tut-tut,' answered the minister, "'it is only their own fears that make such noises terrible to the vulgar. "'As for Blackbeard, I am not here to say whether guilty spirits sometimes cannot rest "'and are seen wandering by men, but for these noises... They are certainly nature's work, as is the noise of waves upon the beach. The floods have filled the vault with water, and so the coffins, getting afloat, move in some eddies that we know not of, and jostle one another. Then, being hollow, they give forth these sounds you hear, and these are your evil angels. It is very true the dead do move beneath our feet, but tis because they cannot help themselves being carried hither and thither by the water. Fie, Ratsy man, you should know better than to fright a boy with silly talk of spirits, when the truth is bad enough. The parson's words had the ring of truth in them to me, and I never doubted that he was right. So this mystery was explained, and yet it was a dreadful thing, and made me shiver to think of the Mahoons all adrift in their coffins and jostling one another in the dark. I picture them to myself, the many generations, old men and children, man and maid, all bones now, each afloat in his little box of rotting wood, and Blackbeard himself in a great coffin bigger than all the rest, coming crashing into the weaker ones, as a ship in a heavy sea comes crashing down sometimes in the trough on a small boat that is trying to board her. And then there was the outer darkness of the vault itself to think of, and the close air, and the black putrid water nearly up to the roof on which such sorry ships were sailing. Ratsy looked a little crestfallen at what Mr. Lenny said, but put a good face on it, and answered, "'Well, master, but a plain man, and know nothing about floods, and these eddies, and hidden workings of nature of which you speak, but, saving your presence, I hold it a fond thing to make light of such warnings as are given us. "'Tis always said, when the moons move, their moonfleet mourns. And I've heard my father tell that the last time they stirred was in Queen Anne's second year, when the great storm blew men's homes about their heads. And as for frightening children, tis well that heady boys should learn to stand in awe, and not pry into what does not concern them, or they may come to harm. 
He added the last words with what I felt sure was a nod of warning to myself, though I did not then understand what he meant. So he walked off in a huff with Elzevir, who was waiting for him outside, and I went with Mr. Lenny and carried his gown for him back to his lodging in the village. Mr. Lenny was always very friendly, making much of me, and talking to me as though I were his equal, which was due, I think, to there being no one of his own knowledge in the neighbourhood, and so he had as leave talk to an ignorant boy as to an ignorant man. After we had passed the churchyard turnstile, and were crossing the sludgy meadows, I asked him again what he knew of Blackbeard and his lost treasure. "'My son,' he answered, "'all that I have been able to gather is that this Colonel John Mahoon, foolishly called Blackbeard, was the first to impair the family fortunes by his excesses, and even let the almshouses fall to ruin and turn the poor away. Unless report strangely belies him, he was an evil man, and besides numberless lesser crimes, had on his hands the blood of a faithful servant, whom he made away with because chance had brought to the man's ears some guilty secret of the master. Then at the end of his life, being filled with fear and remorse, as must always happen with evil livers at the last, he sent for Rector Kindersley of Dorchester to confess him, though a Protestant, and wished to make amends by leaving that treasure so ill-gotten from King Charles, which was all that he had to leave, for the repair and support of the almshouses. He made a last will, which I have seen, to this effect, but without describing the treasure further than to call it a diamond, not saying where it was to be found. Doubtless he meant to get it himself, sell it, and afterwards apply the profit to his good purpose, but before he could do so, death called him suddenly to his account. So men say that he cannot rest in his grave, not having made even so tardy a reparation, and never will rest unless the treasure is found and spent upon the poor. I thought much over what Mr. Lenny had said, and fell to wondering whether Blackbeard could have hid his diamond, and whether I might not find it some day and make myself a rich man. Now, as I considered that noise we had heard under the church, and Parson Lenny's explanation of it, I was more and more perplexed, for the noise had, as I have said, something deep and hollow booming in it, and how was that to be made by decayed coffins? I had more than once seen Ratsey, in digging a grave, turn up pieces of coffins, and sometimes a tarnished nameplate would show that, that they had not been so very long underground, and yet the wood was quite decayed and rotten. And granting that such were in the earth, and so might more easily perish, yet when the top was taken off old Guy's brick grave to put his widow beside him, Master Ratsey gave me a peep in, and old Guy's coffin had cracks and warps in it, and looks as if a sound blow would send it to pieces. Yet here were the Mahoon coffins that had been put away for generations, and must be rotten as tinder, tapping against each other with a sound like a drum, as if they were still sound and airtight. Still Mr. Lenny must be right, for it was not the coffins. What should it be that made the noise? So, on the next half day, after we had heard the sounds in church, being the Monday, as soon as morning school was over, off I ran down street and across meadows to the churchyard, meaning to listen outside the church if the Mahoons were still moving. I say outside the church, for I knew Ratsy would not lend me the key to go in after what he had said about boys prying into things that did not concern them. And besides that, I do not know that I would care to venture it inside alone, even if I had the key. When I reached the church, not a little out of breath, I listened to first on the side nearest the village, that is the north side, putting my ear against the wall, and afterwards lying down on the ground, though the grass was long and wet, so that I might the better catch any sound that came. But I could hear nothing, and so concluded that the Mahoons had come to rest again, yet thought I would walk round the church and listen to on the south, or seaside, for that their worships might have drifted over to that side and be there rubbing shoulders with one another. So I went round, and was glad to get out of the cold shade into the sun on the south. But here was a surprise, for when I came round a great buttress which juts out from the wall, what should I see but two men, and these two were Ratsey and Elzevir Block. 
I came upon them unawares, and, lo and behold, there was Master Ratsey lying also on the ground with his ear to the wall, while Elzevir sat back against the inside of the buttress with a spy-glass in his hand, smoking and looking out to sea. Now I had as much right to be in the churchyard as Ratsey or Elzevir, and yet I felt a sudden shame as if I had been caught in some bad act, and knew the blood was running to my cheeks. At first I had it in my mind to, to turn tail and make off, but concluded to stand my ground since they had seen me, and so bade them good morning. Master Ratsey jumped to his feet as nimbly as a cat, and as if he had not been a man I should have thought he was blushing too, for his face was very red, though that came perhaps from lying on the ground. I could see he was a little put about, and out of countenance, though he tried to say, "'Good morning, John,' in an easy tone, as if it were a common thing for him to be lying in the churchyard with his ear to the wall on a winter's morning. "'Good morning, John,' he said, "'and what might you be doing in the churchyard this fine day?' I answered that I was come to listen if the Mahoons were still moving. "'Well, that I can't tell you,' returned Ratsey, not wishing to waste thought on such idle matters, and having to examine this wall whether the floods have not so damaged it as to need underpinning. So if you have time to gad about of a morning, get you back to my workshop, and fetch me a plasterous hammer, which I have left behind, so that I can try this mortar." I knew that he was making excuses about underpinning, for the wall was as sound as a rock, but was glad enough to take him at his word, and beat a retreat from where I was not wanted. Indeed, I soon saw how he was mocking me, for the men did not even wait for me to come back with the hammer, but I met them returning in the first meadow. Master Ratsey made another excuse that he did not need the hammer now, as he had found out that all that was wanted was a little pointing with new mortar. "'But if you have such time to waste, John,' he added, "'you can come to-morrow and help me to get new thwarts and the petrol, which she badly wants.' So we three came back to the village together, but looking up at Elzevir once while Master Ratsey was making these pretenses, I saw his eyes twinkle under their heavy brows as if he was amused at the other's embarrassment. The next Sunday, when we went to church, all was quiet as usual. There was no Elzevir, and no more noises, and I never heard the Mahunes move again. End of chapter 2 Recording by Simon Evers